All right, we can get started. Welcome, everyone. So today, in this session, we're going to be covering some new deployment architectures that we're looking at for Starling X, and uh, we'll go over you know, some details about you know, what the requirements are for those, what we're seeing as uh, input based on our industry deployments with Starling X, and uh, overall, we'll, we'll go through that as a, a detailed architecture review, and then at the end, we'll open it up for some questions in case you have anything that we'll have for that cover that we have to cover. Uh, so I'm Matt Peters. I'm a principal software architect at Wind River for the Wind River Cloud uh, products. And I'm an active contributor to Starling X and a, a member of the community. I've been part of Starling X since 2018, so the original inception. Uh, but even before that, I was part of the OpenStack community working with Neutron and, and Nova and the other, other communities as well. Uh, so let's uh, get started. So uh, I will start out with a bit of an introduction to Starling X, just in case folks are not familiar with it, but I'll focus on the aspects of it that are applicable to these deployment architectures that we're going to talk about. Uh, within this session, I would like to cover our uh, proposals around the hybrid cloud architecture, so bringing Starling X to the, the public cloud and how to manage those uh, systems at the edge. Uh, we're going to be looking at new deployment architectures for geographic redundancy, so specifically around our distributed cloud and how we're going to be managing that in a distributed fashion for geographic survivability. Uh, we're going to look at some optimized network uh, deployment configurations. Uh, as we deploy at scale, this is becoming a, an increasing demand for us to be able to improve and streamline our network configurations. So let's take a look at uh, Starling X and specifically what's applicable to this, uh, this session. So Starling X itself is a, a full stack uh, offering for Kubernetes container platform. Uh, it provides manageability of the physical infrastructure and the deployments at the edge. So it's set up in a hierarchy with centralized services uh, that are running within a, a regional data center. Uh, and then we have a set of distributed edge sites that are providing the, the connectivity for things like 5G and other edge uh, applications. So right now, this deployment architecture is based on a bare metal deployment. So that regional data center is deployed on physical servers in these regional data centers. And they're providing the manageability for those edge sites that are all running Starling X, Kubernetes, and the end-to-end uh, the -end deployment architecture for the distributed cloud. Uh, one thing to note is that these are each all independent Kubernetes clusters. So at the, the central region, we're running a, a Kubernetes cluster that has all the centralized services that we need to manage the distributed system. And each of the edge sites are autonomous, autonomous uh, edge clouds as well. So overall, we treat it as one big uh, geographically distributed system. Uh, but we do talk about uh, the centralized components separate from the edge, where we look at some of the, that manageability. So let's get right into the, the first main topic, which is the hybrid cloud. So we're really seeing a, a push to streamline some of the, the operational costs and uh, capital expenditures that are occurring within the, the overall deployment. So with the regional data centers, depending on the geographic distribution of your edge sites, you may have an, a number of these deployed across the, a national network. Uh, so from a cost perspective, being able to operate each of these independently or even to have dedicated systems is not as cost effective as having a more centralized system. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, different options for you know, being able to support both uh, a scaled up uh, distributed cloud system for those centralized services, as well as uh, what we could do to be able to support portability into the public cloud. So if an operator was looking to be able to optimize for their overall costs, consolidation, uh, we wanted to have that portability and that flexibility. So let's talk about the, the solutions. So in, in order to achieve this, we have two uh, changes that we're looking to make to Starling X. Uh, the first being the uh, centralized services being hosted on public cloud. So this is not a, a full Starling X stack hosted on public cloud, but specifically the distributed services that are related to the centralized management. And we'll get into what those functions are in just a minute. And then the, the portability. So as part of this, you know, certainly we want to have the, the public cloud support, but how do we make it so that it's portable between the different public clouds? How do we make sure it's portable to our, our private on-prem as well? So if we start with the, the starting configuration where we have a bunch of centralized services running at the, the central location, managing the, the far edge sites. Uh, so 
th those centralized services today provide things like remote install, remote deployment of all the edge clouds. So this is a zero touch provisioning of the, the edge sites all from the central location. Uh, we have full lifecycle management, which means that we have to have configuration and state synchronized uh, across these systems so that we understand their operational uh, performance and as well as being able to manage them after day one. So once we get into day two operations, we have to have full lifecycle management. Uh, so that includes things like software updates and upgrades. So when we're looking at a, a mass deployment, we need to be able to not only manage the individual systems, but like I said, we treat it as a, a complete distributed cloud so how do we manage this across the, the entire distributed network and have all these services uh, available for that overall lifecycle management? Uh, in addition to that, there's a number of shared services that we do in this hierarchy. So in the, you know, in the case of deployment of a subcloud, we have things like a container registry that we need to host. Uh, we do it as a hierarchy for scale, so uh, not pulling all from the same you know, private registries or public registries depending on your deployment configuration. We want to be able to set it up in a hierarchy, so we use these regional data centers or the centralized services to provide a, a, a container registry for the, the subtending subclouds. Uh, so that extends to things like some of the identity management, uh, any of the, the booting and installation that we do, so hosting the media. Uh, so by having all of these things in this hierarchy, it allows us to scale it out to whatever geography that we need. So under an individual system, uh, we can get up to uh, like a thousand subclouds. But if we want to scale beyond that or even scale what we're doing for distributed cloud, then we need to be able to scale those services as well. Uh, so the proposal is to take those set of services and move them to or be able to host them on a public cloud Kubernetes. So this means that we are uh, porting the existing Starling X distributed cloud services into that public cloud infrastructure. So this is to be able to host on things like the Amazon EKS, uh, Azure AKS, and Google uh, Kubernetes engine. So this is really about trying to provide that portability so that we can run on any public cloud offering that provides that Kubernetes environment. So decoupling you know, some of these things from the Starling X components, uh, we'll get into you know, what the, some of that decoupling looks like, but the, the intent here is to make it fully uh, portable amongst them. So this offers several uh, different reasons why we want to do this, uh, but one of the enabling functions too is that we want to be able to migrate from our existing regional controllers to public or back depending on what the operator requirements are. So if they, if they realize that they, they want to start out with some physical infrastructure because they're not ready to invest in public cloud, they can do that. We have the ability to migrate today subclouds between different system controllers. Uh, so being able to migrate from on-prem to public cloud is already something that we could be able to achieve and something we want to support. So it all starts with the, the decoupling. So if we take a look at the distributed cloud services, these would be a completely containerized microservice architecture. Uh, today this is integrated into our system controller function within Starling X. So they are integrated services that are managed by Starling X on the platform. Uh, so by decoupling them more, that gives us some of the flexibility to run on any of the Kubernetes clusters. So in that public cloud uh, configuration that we saw, we're looking to use and leverage the, the managed infrastructure from the, the public cloud uh, so that we, we don't really need that extra layer of the, the Starling X uh, infrastructure management at this particular component. So if we're certainly needed it when we're talking about the edge and the lifecycle management of a physical uh, server, all the software management that we do at the edge, but these services specifically can be decoupled and run directly on the, the public cloud infrastructure. Uh, because we have the public cloud, this also means that we can take advantage of some of the managed services. So instead of just the, uh, the public cloud infrastructure for Kubernetes, we are, are able to leverage some of the other uh, components that are offered or services offered by the public cloud. So these things can include things like a managed database service, uh, the message bus services like RabbitMQ. A lot of the different public clouds offer these at scale that are, are managed services which allow you to move up into you know, more of your application space, looking at, your, looking at scaling and managing your own services rather than the, the underlying infrastructure. So whenever it's available, we want to take advantage of those managed services for that increased scale and capacity. Uh, as we'll also see uh, in the, the next topic, uh, we'll be looking at some of the geographic redundancy and a lot of these public clouds offer high availability clusters in different regions and we'll talk about how we're going to even leverage that for some of our geo redundancy. One of the interesting things about this architecture is that uh, because it's portable, we can use the exact same 
uh, design for our private cloud. So rather than having something that's you know, separately deployed specifically for the public cloud, we can do the private cloud in the same way. So again, we're starting with just a regular Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this would be deployed as part of Starling X. So if we're talking about on-prem, we're talking about the full stack offered by Starling X. Uh, that brings the, the containerized platform, all the lifecycle management that we have for that platform, and all of the management that we need for that bare metal services. So uh, the distributed cloud services, I mentioned there's a decoupling aspect. So we, today, the distributed cloud manages both the orchestration for that centralized controller, as well as those subclouds. So when we're talking about public cloud infrastructure, we don't have to manage the, the, the public cloud infrastructure directly. Uh, we can provide the, the deployment and the configuration that we need for that public cloud. Uh, but on-prem, we still need that. So there is a, an integration activity that still occurs between the distributed cloud services and that system management that happens. So that portability gives us the uh, flexibility to deploy in hybrid clouds, uh, public cloud with the centralized management or strictly private cloud. So let's talk about uh, the next major topic, which is geographic redundancy. Uh, so this does have a relationship to what I, I just discussed in terms of the, the public cloud. But what we're really uh, you know, being asked to do is provide uh, the ability to have an extra layer of survivability. So we have the regional controllers, or we have a public cloud uh, deployment that is in one particular region, but we want those services to be always available. So in other words, full management and operations and controls needs to be maintained. So that's independent of any catastrophic event that could have happened to an individual site. So you know, most of the, the demanding industries today for, uh, so most of the industries today demand this type of survivability. Uh, so we have redundancy and local availability, but if we're talking about you know, an entire data center disappearing, how do we maintain that manageability at the edge? Uh, so the, the solution that we're, we're proposing is uh, a redundancy model specific to our distributed cloud architecture. Uh, so the, the edge itself is already you know, massively distributed in the geographic regions. Uh, we're not talking about the, the edge here, we're talking about that centralized management function. Uh, we wanna make sure that under whatever conditions that we're operating in, we can always maintain that visibility because if you lose sight of what's happening of your systems, it's effectively not providing service. You don't know whether it's providing service, uh, so you need to maintain that manageability. So starting with the, our system controller design, so the, uh, the central systems run a local high availability cluster. Uh, what I'm showing here is a bare metal deployment with our typical uh, Starling X deployment with two controllers and a number of worker hosts. So depending on the scale of what you're doing for your distributed cloud, you have uh, different physical server configurations that you may require. Uh, but ge the general prin principle is that you have a local Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it has high bandwidth, low latency networking, all contained within that data center. And then the, the edge sites are you know, remote distributed systems. Uh, within this, we want to be able to layer in a, a second region. So we're taking that exact same configuration and deploying it into a separate region. So this region is separated by geography, so we're talking about hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of miles separation, so that if there is a catastrophic event, it's isolated into that particular region, or at least you know, separate data centers or uh, deployments. So the, the overall design is to provide a shared state across the distributed cloud services. So this is a synchronization for both configuration, uh, site availability, and a replication of the overall deployment of, or visibility into those subclouds. So if one of those sites were to disappear, then we have the full manageability from the other site and it already has the replicated state that we need. So we've chosen not to take a model that is distributed across, um, you know, taking a Kubernetes cluster and distributing it across. So we're doing this at the distributed cloud layer because it eliminates a lot of the complexities that you would have with some of the, the failure scenarios. We can isolate it to the service availability, the service management, all within a, a particular cluster. Uh, but you still get the manageability and the uh, uh, capabilities to be able to do all of the things that I talked about before, like the remote install, the configuration management, all for day one, day two. Uh, another key requirement around this is that uh, it has to be completely transparent to the edge clouds, so if you're if there is a, an event that happens at our system controllers, today we have autonomous subclouds. 
Uh, if a system controller goes away, then the subclouds continue to provide service, so they're not impacted. We have to maintain that model. So we don't want to jeopardize what we have today and, and the availability that we have today based on you know, uh, adding this extra layer, or adding this uh, layer of redundancy. So the, the switch between them or the failover, whatever you want to call it, has to be transparent. So in order to achieve that replication, what we're doing is proposing a, a subcloud peer group. So these are effectively just uh, an organization of the subclouds, so the, those physical servers that are at the edge, organized into groups that we can de designate as either primary or secondary sites across a set of system controllers. So in this model, we're not restricted to you know, a one plus one, you know, in that picture that I drew on the, the, the other one where it just has the, the replicated site. Uh, what we're actually showing here is three sites. So you can have them all actively providing service, managing their subclouds, uh, but having some spare capacity so that if we need that redundancy and be able to move the management of those subclouds, we can move it to another site. So taking the, the example here of region one, we would replicate uh, sub, subcloud peer group A and B to another site. So I've simplified this, it's just going to another region. We could split them, we can have it any other combination that you need for your redundancy model. Uh, it could even be replicated out to multiple sites, so not just one replica, but you know several replicas, depending on what you require for your survivability. So again, we're you know just expand on that model. We have all of our spare capacity being able to be distributed amongst all the available system controllers that are available within the overall uh, national deployment, and you have full redundancy across your distributed cloud services for the manageability of those subclouds that are designated to a particular peer group. So this is a, a logical entity. It, it's a grouping that the, the operator can define. So they can define whatever parameters that make sense to them for that redundancy. It can be proximity to their, their uh, subclouds themselves. So they want you know, the system controllers near their subclouds. It could be based on their manageability or policy that they have within their, their own data centers. So with this model, it makes it very simple for us to be able to move the, the management between the different systems. So if we're, we take just the one subcloud peer group as an example, it has the set of subclouds that belong to that group. They're all actively being managed by a primary site. Uh, but what we want to do is to have it so that the individual sites uh, can take over at any time. So using a simple priority-based system, uh, we can you know, have the, the monitoring or the heartbeating or whatever external services that is validating the health of the system. So this could be you know, internal to what we're providing or even an external entity that's making a higher order decision. Uh, being able to integrate into that allows us to switch that uh, prime ship between them uh, based on priority very simply. Uh, because we're talking about uh, management control plane functions, we don't have to switch over in you know, sub-second or even second timeframes. So we can make decisions about what the overall network topology looks like so that we can avoid things like you know, network partitioning, uh, you know, isolation of one site, you know, being a peer that it's you know, unavailable when it can actually be providing service to its subclouds. Uh, so in this example, we actually uh, continue to provide heart beating service to those subclouds so that we can incorporate that into our decisions. So you know, when you're trying to establish a quorum or understanding whether you want to actually move these subclouds to a new location, you don't want to take that lightly because you're going to be effectively moving the management all the way over to another system controller. You don't want to thrash it around. You want something that has policy included. You want to make sure you're making the right decisions. So this simple scheme allows us to provide that management across those different uh, systems in a, in a mechanism that is straightforward for us and the operators to understand. So if that one site uh, goes down, it's a very simple algorithm to move the, the ownership over to another system controller, and that prime ship, when it moves, uh, is transparent to those subclouds, so they'll just start reporting their, their availability, their manageability will all come from that new system controller. So from their perspective, there's no change in their operational state, uh, but the operators will be able to continue to provide that management function to them. All right, so with that, uh, what we've discussed is really a layered in approach to our distributed cloud architecture where we can provide that geo redundancy across our distributed cloud services. Uh, but next we'll look at uh, a, sort of a, a continuation of some of the improvements that we're looking to make around Starling X in the deployment. So we've gained a lot of experience in you know, deploying at scale. We understand some of the pain points that our operators are having with that deployment and understanding you know, where we need to make improvements. 
And one of those is in the, the network optimization. So uh, before we jump into some of the improvements or things that the, the operators are looking for, I want to start with where we are today with our, our network configuration. So what I have depicted here is a single system, uh, a multi-node system. So it's a little more complex than some of the, the subclouds that we have today. But if you, uh, I wanted to provide the more complex example so you can see what some of our operators would have for larger scale deployments of those subclouds. Uh, so these, um, an individual system has many different network segments that are attached for different functions. So whether it's you know, operations and management uh, interface that's provided um, more of a, a public or uh, an internal uh, available interface versus a, uh, an internal network that's specific to the system. We have these different segments for security reasons, for operation, operational reasons, uh, but this also adds an extra layer of complexity for our operators because with this flexibility means they have to assign network addresses, they have to just define the VLANs, they have to set up the networking and, and routing for these uh, interconnected hosts. And when you are repeating this across you know, tens of thousands of systems, then it becomes a, a pretty large management function to be able to plan out your network and be able to uh, make sure that you have the right resources allocated. Uh, we also have a combination of layer two and layer three networking. So we have uh, redundancy provided internally and externally for some of our addresses based on floating IP. So if a physical server goes away, we want to continue to provide an endpoint for that service so it floats between them, uh, which means that we do need a layer two network today to be able to move those services. Uh, we also have requirements for multicast traffic, which is uh, well known to be a problem for <laughs> people to deploy and get right. So uh, whether it's, you know, initial deployment and multicast is just not working or it's just not contained within the scope that they're expecting. Uh, so we really want to simplify, you know, what we're doing around the the end to end network configuration that we have for our system. So this comes in several different forms. We have uh, key optimizations that we want to make. One is in the reduction of the overall number of addresses we have for the system. We want a simplification of the, uh, the overall network architecture. So, you know, I, I drew that other diagram that shows the complexity that's there. How can we simplify it? How do we reduce that down? Uh, we do recognize the fact that not every deployment is the same. So some, you know, some operators will demand that we have you know, dedicated network interfaces for certain functions. We have uh, physical network partitioning or even logical with VLANs. So we, even though we want to simplify it, we still need to maintain some flexibility. And finally, it doesn't stop at day one. <laughs> so after deployment, you may, you know, recognize that you want to renumber your, your networks. So you can't just go in there and say, okay, well, I'm going to redeploy when you have, you know, tens of thousands of systems. So day two operations and network reconfiguration is very important. So we have several initiatives to be able to solve a lot of these uh, issues. I'm going to dive into one specifically around the address reduction, uh, or subnet reduction, I should say, uh, because I think that's the biggest gain for our operators. Uh, but we are looking to make improvements across the board in terms of uh, the overall uh, key optimizations that I identified. So we will be looking to eliminate the multicast traffic using configuration for endpoints, uh, not discovery through multicast. Uh, we will be offering uh, network reconfiguration for all interfaces or all networks. Uh, today we have uh, some restrictions on certain internal networks, so removing those barriers so that you know, we can renumber or reconfigure any of our, our network interfaces and uh, overall network addressing. But let's take a look at the, uh, the network model that we're, we have today and how we're looking to change this for our deployment. So the uh, within our Starlin X, as you saw with all those different ne network segments, it really maps to uh, multiple network functions. So if you, you have platform networks is what we refer to them, that's really just a classification of what its role is within the system. Uh, so whether it's O&M, management, pixie booting, uh, we have these all separated out from a, an internal function perspective. And that today translates to separate networks. So we, we have address pools and network segments defined for each of these functions. So that's where you get into your, your minimum deployment footprint means that you need a minimum of seven subnets just to deploy uh, your system, which uh, depending on the, the complexity of your network and how you manage your, your network infrastructure, that can be complex. So even though some of these are internal subnets, uh, which means that they could be reused by individual systems, some of them are not, some of them need external networking, which means they have to be globally unique. Uh, so the proposal is to go to, um, or have the flexibility to be able to do a completely shared model. 
Uh, so we still maintain the, the individual network functions, but we have flexibility on whether we're using a shared interface or we're using shared address pools. So whether we're using the same address or we're pulling from the same address pools to at least reduce the subnets, uh, we have the ability to reduce the, the amount of addresses and subnets that the, the operator needs to manage. This also means that it translates to the layer two partitioning as well. So as we look at uh, our transition from layer two to layer three only networking, uh, we want to reduce the number of VLANs that are required and you know, having separate network segments for it is problematic. So when we look at a shared model, it makes it much, e much easier to move to this. So rather than having you know, multi-netted interfaces, you can have a, a shared model where the addresses themselves are shared. So this allows us to get down to the minimum requirements of a Kubernetes deployment, which is your, your host level addressing, and then your, your specific address pools for your pods and your services. We recognize the fact that you know, not all of the deployments will be able to have uh, the network configuration to have that you know, level of sharedness because of the security requirements or just partitioning that they want. Uh, so that flexibility means that we have different options. We can do public, private, or we can do that full shared model, or even go all the way back to the, the original picture that I showed that has everything partitioned. So let's do a, a quick wrap up. Uh, so what we looked at today was a new portable and scalable distributed cloud deployment architecture for both public and private cloud. We looked at the new geographic redundancy and survivability of our distributed cloud operations for both private and public cloud. And we looked at uh, some network optimizations that we're making to help our operators reduce the overall complexity of their network planning. So there's many new industries that we're getting into with Starling X, so it's you know, critical that we do this now to be able to support all of these different industries. Uh, there's you know, new requirements coming in, new challenges, so we welcome contributors to Starling X. So if you're interested or interested in defining you know, what this looks like for you know, Starling X deployments or other use cases that you may have for Starling X, uh, please come to starlinex.io or join our Starling X Discuss where we talk about these topics, where we can plan out these designs and be able to support the, uh, the overall evolution of Starling X. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? We got a few minutes. Right over here. You had a slide that had a VPN or a software defined network mm -hmm. in the middle of that. Can you briefly describe what parts of Starling X support that? Right. And what the alternatives are in that space? Because it seemed like if you're using a VPN between sites, you have a failure to name, that's a failure of VPN rather yeah. than. Yeah, that's really to uh, provide, that, that picture was representing the bridge between the, the public cloud network infrastructure that's offered versus the, the private infrastructure that's being hosted by the network operators. So uh, it's a, you know, most of the, the public clouds offer some form of VPN service to be able to connect your private cloud. Uh, it varies by the different uh, public cloud uh, offerings, but the intent is that it's, it's mostly transparent to Starling X. Uh, we are operating with that bridge or that separation. So we have to support anything that comes with it in terms of uh, network latency that may be introduced for the, the distribution because we're now talking about separation. Uh, today, Starling X already has isolation between or can support isolation between the distributed cloud central services and the subclouds. So we're very adaptable to network latency or network disruption. Uh, so it should be fairly transparent to us. It's just the different offerings that are available to connect your private to public cloud offering. There's uh, one question in the back first. Um, for the uh, situation between uh, common and subcloud versus the interesting network and maybe between the operator and cloud, do you have any sense of like who will control or at some point get around how long servers will connect over, like how long before it goes to potentially too long before it steps up to those lines? Right. Uh, so the way it operates today is it's uh, completely autonomous. So in theory, they could run you know, indefinitely. You just may not have visibility or operation of any of the lifecycle management. Uh, so from a, like locally, the Kubernetes cluster is fully available. So if there's lifecycle management requirements for individual services or pods, they can restart or recover. Uh, the only time that you start to get into recovery scenarios for length, uh, longer periods of time of outage is when you get into things like your certificate management you know, a certificate that's about to expire and you need to maintain that connectivity secure connection. Uh, how do you renew that certificate when connectivity is restored if it expired when, you know, it was disconnected? 
So today, a lot of our certificates, depending on which one we're talking about and which is used for different communication, can be you know, upwards of 30 minutes for the window to, to renew. Uh, but it really depends on that overall configuration. So uh, I, I just know some out of time, but I can take other questions you know, offline if, or if it's quick. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's actually hosted like in s different ones versus just uh, I, I haven't really seen that particular use case usually it's one cloud provider and using their different geographical regions or availability zones to deploy I haven't seen a use case where it would be you know multiple public clouds working together Yes. So the subclouds themselves have to have multiple IP addresses for the different controllers, for the uh, failover controllers also? Uh, uh, what we have is a, no, they can be transparent. So we have, uh, the centralized system knows about the subcloud addressing and the connectivity. Uh, it has the ability to connect and securely connect to those systems. Uh, what happens when they move is what we refer to as a rehoming activity. Uh, we reconfigure the subcloud to have a different management function. So that one that's taken over says, you know, I'm your new owner. I'm going to be providing your management function, and it synchronizes whatever it needs to provide that management function. So the subcloud is effectively reconfigured uh, on the fly to be able to have a different manager or a different management function. Okay, and what happens if um, there is no connectivity to the subcloud? So if the if subcloud stays completely open, isolated. They, they will continue to run, you just can't yeah. do uh, other operations. So if you, if you had to connect to it to do software upgrades or other management or maintenance functions, you wouldn't have connectivity, but they themselves continue to operate. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.